Hey everyone, this is David with Streaming Relativity, home of the Astro DNA Observatory. Today we're going to examine the PHD2 logs from the first light sequence with the Ioptron CEM120 mount. My goal is to review the calibration data, take a look at the guiding assistant recommendations, and the overall statistics from the session. If you use PHD2 and you have never looked at the logs before, stick around because this is an important topic and necessary if you want to achieve optimal guiding performance. But before I jump into it, I wanted to share the, these cool color studies that I'm working on for NGC 1975. And of course, this is the data that I captured during the first light sequence with the CEM120. So NGC 1975 is the Running Man Nebula in the constellation Orion. It's found in the sword of Orion, and it's most often imaged as a uh, with wide field instruments as part of uh, M42, which includes the Orion Nebula itself. Uh, but isolating Running Man using longer focal length telescopes, such as like the C8, which is what I used in this case. It's actually pretty cool. And someday uh, I want to create a mosaic of this region, perhaps the entire constellation, by stitching together many of these smaller field of view images into one larger field of view. But for now, I'm just playing around with the data that we ca that I captured and using some pixel math to produce some interesting variants of the show color palette. And the, but the pixel math and 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 the actual processing of this data is for another video entirely. So, and by the way, if you have not already done so, go ahead, like and subscribe uh, so you get notified when these videos are published. You know, with that, let's talk about this video, which I call First Light Forensics. Part one, PhD two. And this is about my philosophy that in every astrophotography sequence, there is a crime. It's the same crime every time, which is something has robbed us of our perfect data. And uh, we all know that perfect data is an impossibility. It's more of a goal state. Because uh, even with the best equipment and fully optimized configurations, there are circumstances that are way outside of our control that affect the quality of the data, seeing as a perfect example of it. So all we can do is assume imperfect data and be on the lookout for clues or evidence that point to things that we can control. And a perfect spot to look is the PhD2 guiding log for the session. Okay, so um, this next section of the video, I'll be um, real-time analyzing the logs for the first time. So it's a non-scripted uh, section, so just bear with me as you, as you listen to me think out loud and come to some conclusions. This is the four-hour session, PhD2 guiding session for that first light sequence. And um, the statistics for the entire four hours, um, about 0.77 arc seconds of total RMS. The scene was not terrific um, that evening. And, and so it's not, a, it's actually not a bad, it's not bad at all, given I've done no tuning to the mount yet. Um, <clears throat> but I did see some gremlins in the deck uh, axis direction that I wanted to just do a little bit of investigation on. Um, so looking at the, you know, looking at the four-hour session uh, in totality, um, you'll, you'll notice periodic, um, periodic spikes that in both RA and DEC that actually line up with our dithering. So I'm not concerned about those. Those are uh, to be expected. But what I am concerned about, and what I what caught my eye, these large corrections that are happening every so often in the DEC. And I think you know, I won't. I, I'll, I'll do a detailed analysis on this, but just 
for those who have never looked at a uh, PhD2 log, um, you can hover over the correction and, uh, and see uh, what there, there are the stats are uh, for each frame are, are listed here. So we have a correction of uh, what appears to be um, 2785 milliseconds. So this is um, this is a rather large correction and I was taking a look at the um, the backlash comp compensation in PhD2 seems to be it was enabled and it may have been based on uh, what I, uh, what the, the the manual assistant said to do but this is set for backlash compensation of about 2900 um, milliseconds so I think what's happening is that for one reason or another, periodically, and it's happening rather consistently. There is a need to change direction in the deck axes. A correction needs to happen in the opposite direction. And that causes a pulse, uh, you know, a compensation pulse. But maybe, maybe this is too aggressive this backlash compensation setting. And I think we could probably eliminate a lot of this, these strong spikes, and, uh, and they seem to be alternating as if they're fighting each other here. So let's just see if that's consistent. Yeah. Yeah. No matter where we look, uh, it's not, not other than, of course, the dithering. We seem to have these competing deck corrections yeah and look we started to really freak out over here these are competing deck corrections that uh, I think we can adjust yep competing deck corrections so it's ch it's chasing so I, I think this is a compensation issue a, de a, a deck ba a backlash compensation issue so really what this is telling me is that I should take a closer look at the measured deck backlash of the CEM 120 and um, see if there's some uh, mesh work that can be done if if it's truly if it's truly off then we should probably try to physically correct for the deck backlash. So at any rate, that's just a little bit of a kind of um, a quick, uh, you know, quick forensics on the uh, PhD guiding log. Okay, PhD2 makes it fairly easy for you to see the measured backlash um, and you can do that by going to tools and you can choose guiding assistant do not run the guiding assistant rather there's a button called uh, review previous and I'm going to pull up the guiding assistant run prior to the just prior to the four hour first light sequence that uh, that we're working that, that we're working with now, and um, you'll notice <clears throat> that the, all of the information that uh, the guiding assistant had presented at the time of the run is, st is 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 present again. We're interested in the performance of guiding in the deck axes. Let's also make note of the polar alignment error, as well as the uh, minimum move in the deck direction. I'm going to open up the backlash graph and clearly we can see that the ideal scenario uh, with southern pulses uh, and the pulse widths uh, being around 899 milliseconds or 900 milliseconds that uh, this is ideal what we should have seen a measurable movement in the deck 
Um, um, but we'll notice that really there was um, some backlash here or, or play equivalent to about one, two, three, let's call it three, three pulses of with 900 milliseconds went by before we started to get the behavior that we would expect from the deck. That's all play in the, in the, in the gear mesh presumably. And so if there's three pulses, that's roughly 2,700 milliseconds of backlash, measure, measured, measured backlash. And in fact, if we look at the recommendation being made by the guiding assistant, it's, it's actually 2,660, 2,660 milliseconds of backlash compensation. And those are the values, that, that value is what we see in the logs when we see these corrective pulses in the log what this is is that there's a change in direction that needs to be made on the deck axis a correction in the revert that's opposite the last correction that was made and so this large pulse is being sent to pick up the slack it's the backlash compensation pulse and then it goes about its business so that explains whenever we have a change in direction in the deck pulse, corrective pulse, uh, you, you you need to make up for the backlash. And that's what's happening here. Um, and uh, this is just an easy way for you to confirm if for those who want to know whether or not, uh, and want to know how to get access to their measured, their uh, measured backlash. Okay, so we know we have an issue with the deck backlash, and there is going to be some physical adjustment to the mount, and I will video that when I do it. But I also mentioned that I thought that there was something that we might be able to do within PHD2 to reduce the amount of aggressive, um, 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 aggressive backlash compensation um, moves that that we were seeing and and um and what i decided to do uh was simply take down the deck aggression from 100 percent to 90 percent and leave all other things as they were and um we're looking at a at nina right now this is um uh obviously a uh um, a different session this was a session a session that i ran on the 19th of november um w uh, and it's uh, uh the crab nebula uh messier one but what i'm here to really show you is that the uh total the the, the seeing was no better in fact the seeing was a little bit worse on the 19th than it was on the 12th, but we have total um, a total uh, total error of 0.63 arc seconds. That's total RMS, uh, which is substantially lower for the same four-hour period. This is four-hour period um, than when we had uh, when deck aggression was at 100. And uh, if we go ahead and take a look at the logs and we open up, this is using the log viewer. If we go ahead and open up uh, the, the logs from the 19th and uh, we uh, go to the four hour guiding session and we zoom in, of course we have our dithering, but notice that throughout in between the dithering, there's very infrequent, so here's one, there's one compensation pulse, but certainly, uh, my, you know, and this compensation pulse, pulse seems to be directly related to dithering, again, after dithering, um, after dithering, but throughout, but, but, the guiding in between, so there's multiple, there are, you know, the, the dithering is every three frames here. You'll, you'll notice that there are no significant deck uh, backlash compensation pulses. Just just a little bit here after, after the dithering, we see a little bit, which, which is okay. So a 90% aggression as opposed to 100% aggression. 
has had a net positive impact on the guiding session. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, there are lots of things that can be done within PhD2 to address the measured uh, backlash. Um, in fact, you know, why don't we just take a, a couple of minutes to review some of the other parameters that uh, are, are associated with the uh, DEC axes algorithms. Okay, so to access some of the relevant settings, you can open PhD2 and you can either select the brain option uh, down below or you can go to a guide and advanced settings and um, and you'll see that there are four tabs in the advanced settings uh, dialog and there's a if you go to the tab called algorithms um, here you'll see options and parameters that you can use to fine tune both the deck and the right ascension um, um, guiding algorithms and uh, we're going to stick to discussion of uh, of of the deck um, um, algorithm and its parameters and by default phd2 uses the uh, uh, resist switch algorithm for calculating its deck guidance and uh, this is a uh, this algorithm's a f algorithm is a form of hysteresis that tends to resist any changes in in guide direction and uh, so I and that's appropriate for for the deck uh, for equatorial amounts and so I do not uh, recommend changing that algorithm however the parameters associated with that algorithm um, uh, you can uh, you can experiment with and uh, so starting with aggressiveness we we just witnessed the impact of aggressiveness uh, on my last uh, session, and for clarity, aggressiveness uh, that parameter is is a factor that is applied to the guidance correction values that PhD two calculates based on your guide star movement. So if by setting aggressiveness to ninety, that results in a 90% uh, factor being applied to any calculated guidance correction value that PhD2 uh, has come up with based on the guide star movement. So if, the, if, if it was calculated, uh, if the calculated value were um, to create a move of 0.4 pixels, um, then PhD would actually send uh, pulses to achieve um, point three six pixels of movement instead and that's because i'm i'm using 90 percent um aggressiveness now the other parameter um available is uh called the minimum move value which is measured in pixels and so the way phd2 works is that um, it will not calculate or issue i should say a guidance correction pulse until the guide star the apparent movement of the movement of the guide star has has gone beyond the minimum that minimum value, and um, uh, if we raise that value, meaning uh, the minimum value before uh, that that's uh, before a, a correction is issued, you'll likely have less frequent guide pulses being issued. Um, now, those guide pulses may or may not be, uh, by the way, larger pulses than what you had before with, with a smaller value. You really play with this uh, um, um, to deal with uh, seeing conditions of the night of the session. Now, finally, uh, with this algorithm, there is this option uh, which uh, is called fast switch for large deflections. And that's normally not checked by default. But after running the guiding assistant on my mount, it, it did get checked off. And it's a tri the, the check off of this, the recommendation of checking this off uh, is, is, is related to the, the large measured backlash of my mount, which we've 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 gone through exhaustively, so that that I I expect that once I address the meshing uh, uh, for the deck uh, uh, gear and eliminating this physical play, 
uh, that that may exist there that then I'll be able to uncheck this uh, this option and um, and have it behave like it, it normally does uh, its default behavior. Okay, we see here that PHD2 has enabled backlash compensation and has set an amount uh, roughly equal to uh, the value that it measured during calibration. You'll also see that there's a min and max value, and that's because backlash compensation, the value that uh, PHD2 will apply when reversing uh, the correction pulse actually varies based on the pointing position of the mount and i'm gonna you know i'm not 100 percent certain but i'm sure that it's using some form of hysteresis as well to uh, feedback and uh, validate the corrections over time that it's making so there's a stabilization period for this um but um generally speaking here's the rule um number one Use PHD2 for backlash compensation uh, if you need it during guiding. Turn it off in your mount. CEM120 does not even have options for for built-in back, uh, backlash um, adjustments. Uh, it technically should not have any backlash issues by design. But, um, but if your mount does support that, uh, turn it off in the mount and let PHD2 take care of it. It'll do a very nice job up to about, at least PHD2 manual says, up to about three seconds of backlash. Okay, speaking of the mount, let's go ahead and open up Commander and see uh, where we have options related uh, to guiding. So there, there are actually three main areas that will will eventually explore one um uh, you open up the mount panel and uh, you'll see there's something called periodic correction and that relates to tracking and guiding performance in ra and this will be a topic of a separate uh, a separate short video uh, but if we go ahead and move over to the mount settings uh, there are um, three areas of interest here. First is uh, the guide rate, which by default is set to 0.5 sidereal. And um, this is the magnitude of the compensation rate of the guide pulses that PHD2 will send uh, to the mount. And uh, it's applied in addition to the uh, tracking rate of the mount. So uh, by default, it's 0.5, and there has I, I have seen discussions of using a higher rate for um, for the deck as a way to combat um, backlash uh, issues. Uh, my preference is to solve the backlash issues uh, physically in the mount and and to leave these values uh, as they are. And so that's my that's my game plan relative to to guide rate. I'll just make a quick note that uh, there are a couple of other things here that you might as well uh, address. Altitude limit. This has to do with um, the minimum number of degrees above the horizon that a target should be uh, or must be um, in order for the mount to slew to it and or track through it. And um, in my case, I don't. I really don't have any obstructions and or. Uh, concerns inside my observatory or in terms of my view for that matter. So I leave this at zero. Um, and then finally, meridian behavior, um, which really, depending on how you do your flips, you're either going to stop the mount uh, at some point uh, or perform a flip at that point. And, and that point is measured in degrees past the meridian and i rely on nina for my meridian flip behavior and so i i use commander uh as a safety switch or safety valve so if if for whatever reason nina fails to uh, handle the flip uh timely uh if i get to 10 degrees past the meridian i'm stopping the mount so um those are those are uh, mount set settings so there's one other thing i i, I think uh, we, uh you should look at at this at this time and that is um the firmware information now uh i, I said earlier i don't like to chase uh i don't like to chase firmware in fact iopron says you know don't upgrade firmware unless you need to and i i i subscribe to that philosophy but because i was having some um, i'm you know i am working through some issues firmware may come up so i decided let me take a peek at 
my firmware version and um, and so uh, the firmware for the CEM20 is broken up into uh, the, the main board, the RA board, the deck board, and then the controller, the hand controller itself. So 210605 and 210420 uh, for the uh, RA and DAC. So I went and I looked at the uh, firmware history and I found um, 210605 and 210420. And um, I noticed uh, that, well, what, what did it include um, and, and what bug, bug fixes did it address? And uh, lo and behold, uh, you know, the, it says here that it is optimized auto guiding performance, especially in the, uh, in the DAC. So uh, I do happen to have that release. Now, there have been two additional um, firmware releases. One for the hand controller only. So if you look with each release of firmware, they'll mention whether or not there's a ch what the firmware versions will be for your main, your RA, and your deck. No change, but there was a, an update to the hand controller, which uh, apparently allows slewing in uh, the mount in both, uh, both axes at the same time. And then there was another firmware update, which did affect the main board, uh, but not the RA or the deck uh, uh, axis controllers um, and uh, but that was related to a minor bug uh, relative to the GPS display so at the moment you know I, I don't see anything in the firmware um, um, that I need to do and again I, I'm not changing firmware I may I may actually uh, research both the hand controller update and this uh, main board update but, you know, I'm not compelled to rush to do it because neither of these features are important to me. Okay, so that's, that's, that's a quick peek at Commander. So just one other thing here. Uh, notice how I'm only talking about the deck, guiding in the deck. And it's because I didn't see any issues in terms of guiding in, in right ascension. And, yeah, that algorithm is using hysteresis, which is the default algorithm. Some people might be screaming, why aren't you using predictive PEC? Well, I may, uh, but right now I don't have problems in RA. What I have is uh, clearly, from my forensics, what I have is a, a backlash issue uh, in DEC, and that's what I want to deal with. Finally, as a rule of thumb, do not change these parameters unless you've thought through the impact. Have a thesis and test it. Limit your variables to one or two at a time. Extend your testing across multiple sessions and do not be surprised if some of the settings that work one night don't work so well on another. So don't consider this a one and done process. Okay, so there's one last thing that I like to look at in the PhD2 logs and that has to do with the... Um, polar alignment error and uh, one thing that you can do is uh, open up your uh, your log viewer and 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 take a peek at the calibration um, sections of your log and you're going to look to see uh, how PhD2 um, plotted its calibration steps and you're looking for a nice orthogonal um, a graph here, meaning a 90 degree angle. And uh, that's usually a very good indicator of polar alignment. In fact, if we look at at the calibration, that, that was the first calibration done, and then we look at the calibration that was done prior to the first light sequence, looks very nice. And uh, we'll even go ahead and we'll open up the 19th um, and take a look at the calibration sessions on the 19th. Very nice. Um, and this is this actually suggests that you know we have decent polar alignment. But when we go and we look further, let's open up the twelfth again, and we know we had good polar alignment because you know we ran through it with sharp cap and um, we got it down to six seconds of 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 of, of, of polar error. But when we go ahead and we look at the actual guiding sessions. Um, this was an hour spent on M33. We and we go to the drift tab. We're seeing 
a polar alignment error of four minutes and si uh, four point six minutes. If we go to the guiding session uh, just prior to the four hour, after we did another calibration, we uh, we see polar alignment error of 0.1 minutes. And then if we look at our first light sequence, we see 1.1. And then finally, we'll go to the, we'll open up the 19th and we'll see what we experienced there on that four hour session, 6.3. So the polar alignment errors all over the map, despite having a relatively nice calibration plot, so what could be causing this? Well, the answer is um, differential flexure. Okay, in, uh, in my rig, I have a guide scope. And that means that I have a separate guiding train from my main imaging train. And when you have separate trains, um, you open up the possibility that there could be movement in one train relative to the other. And that can happen for a number of reasons. And when it does happen, we call that differential flexure. Now, typically you see evidence of differential flexure in your image data, but you can also see evidence of it in PHD2, and that's in the form of a, of a floating uh, polar error. And the reason why it shows up in that way is that the differential flexure or the, this potential relative movement of the image and guiding uh, trains relative to each other is often a function of the pointing position of the mount because it is largely affected by gravity um, and stresses that occur on the image and the guiding train uh, during your session. And if we and if we think about it, you know, if uh, let's just isolate the guide scope for a moment, what movement could we possibly see, or uh, independent movement of the guiding train? How could that possibly happen? Well, it could happen because there's a loose guide scope mount. So the guide scope is mounted to the OTA, and uh, uh, and you can see there's a dovetail uh, plate and. Um, you know, there's a clamp, but we also see that the guide scope itself is fastened and held centered uh, via two rings, and those rings each have three fasteners, which, you know, could be loose or need to be, you know, we need to make sure that they're tight. So those are possible physical um, security points that are vulnerable um, uh, our vulnerable points for our our our, 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 guide, our guide train. We also have cables that connect to the guide scope. Uh, we have the camera, of course, which um, is attached uh, to the guide scope, and then its USB cable. We also have, in my case, I have a uh, dew strap with a USB cable that runs back from the dew strap that provides power. Um, depending on, again, the pointing position of the mount, there may be some interesting stresses being placed on the guide scope from those cables. And so these are all things that could contribute to the guide scope um, uh, motion or the guide train motion. What about the primary um, um, uh, imaging train? Well, in this case, um, uh, the C8 is, a, is obviously it's a schmidt kazagrand telescope design, which unfortunately, you know, by design, the primary mirror um, uh, it, it can be moved, and that's how actually you focus an SCT. And uh, that means that there is um, possible play in that mirror. It doesn't, it, you know, it, it is not locked in place. And, and depending on, the, again, the pointing position of the mount, you might experience something called mirror flop. And actually, I have a very bad case of it in this, in this particular um, um, C8 specimen. And this is where uh, uh, the mirror settles into a different uh, position um, depending on uh, what side of the meridian uh, we're pointing on. And similarly, uh, there is something called image shift, 
where as you focus an SCT, the primary mirror is pushed forward or drawn back. And uh, really, it's relying on some grease to you know, keep that smooth and even. But by design, the pressure point from the focuser is, is off center. And so it can cause a uh, misalignment of the prime, a slight misalignment of the primary mirror, mirror uh, when, when focusing. So, and then lastly, but, but not least, um, beyond the optical tube assembly, you have the, uh, the actual components, the imaging components, which uh, um, might include a focus or a filter wheel, um, some extension tubes, and then ultimately your camera. And uh, all of these components are connected in a variety of ways uh, through either threaded connections and or clamps. And there's different ways that this is accomplished, but they are subject to tilt because, uh, you know, again, depending on gravity and how it's pulling on that and, and the arrangement of those accessories, you might have slight wobble tilt um, um, in, that, in, in that train. And all of that results in, again, a relative... Um, uh, change in the main imaging uh, train versus the guiding train. All of that contributes to differential flexure. So my conclusion on this is that um, th I see evidence in PD PhD2. I actually see evidence in the images themselves in my subs. And uh, so uh, in addition to investigating the backlash compensation, I will work on this, uh, 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 this differential flexure issue. Okay, with that, we're going to call this a wrap. We know that uh, there's a little bit of work to do relative to the mount, and that would be adjusting the um, gear meshing uh, on the deck axes, um, hopefully to pull in that backlash and eliminate it. And uh, also we have a little bit of uh, differential flexure. Uh, that we can try to adjust by um, tightening down the guide scope as well as making sure the accessory train that we have is good, tight, and uh, not introducing any tilt. Um, not much we can do about mirror flop. I know we have it. Uh, I know it exists on my C8. And uh, ultimately, it may influence my decision to continue to try to use the C8 as a medium long focal length imaging rig. I, 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 I might not ultimately do that, but we'll see. Um, at any rate, thanks so much for watching the video. I hope everybody got something out of it. I know I did. It was a great forensic session and uh, I will see you on the next video.